welcome to a very special week on the wine show at home. We're going to be here for three days this week because this week is Shabley week. Shabley week on the wine show at home. Why Shabley? I'm going to, there are two reasons. I'm going to read you just a little bit. I, I found this just the other day. It's from 1864. It's from a guy called Dr. Jules Guyot, a name that any students of wine will be familiar with from uh, the way vines are trained. And he says, Shabley wines have a fine gold colour with a green tint. They are strong, although not overly so, and their bouquet is charming. They are distinguished by the lively, beneficial and lucid way they stimulate the mind. And they still do, even today, 1864. Why are we coming to Shabley? If you understand Shabley, it sort of helps you understand the wine world in general. And here is a region with a single grape variety, Chardonnay, where the wines are made similarly by different producers. And yet it's like all the finest wine regions of the world. It sits on the limit of where grapes ripen, which means that you get really interesting vintage variation. It's different years bring out kind of different characters. It's a region which has, I mean, what has to be described as a sort of royalty of soils. And depending on exactly what soils you've got, exactly where you are, exactly how they face, you get slightly different characters. You can see some of those. And you've got different quality levels that then run through. So you've got some wines which are aperitif drinking and some which need quite a long time to come round. And so the sort of world of wine is all captured in this one region that's actually quite straightforward to understand. It's one town, it's Chablis, it's one grape, and yet you can understand everything else if you get this. That's the idea. There is a third reason I really like Chablis and really wanted to go and do something where we just talk about Chablis, but lots of you have asked about these questions, so we thought this is a great way to go and explain them. Well, let's begin with the first wine, because there are four tiers. I'm going to try three of them today. There's a reason why I'm not trying the fourth. I will explain. So when we go to Chablis, we have a Petit Chablis is the aperitif starter pack. That's the wrong sort of way. It's, the, it, it's not a, a lesser wine. It's just a different wine, really. I'm going to have a, it still has that straw-coloured, green-tinted hue to the colour, just like Jules Goyot was talking about in 1864. And with all the wines, they all have a kind of mineral tang that runs right the way through them. Minerality is really hard, a sort of challenging concept to get. What else could it be described as? There's a sort of zestiness, there's a sophistication about the wines, uh, there's a freshness, there's a kind of direction. There's all of those bits in it, but we tend to use the term mineral, partly because we tend to think of it as being a bit like uh, wet stones on a river. And this has it. Petit Chablis is a little bit more fruity. It's a little bit more just sort of generous. Is that a word? Generous. It's a simpler wine, partly because it goes on slightly different um, bedrock. So as we'll come through, we'll come to a slightly different bedrock in a minute. But around the, the sort of town, a little bit further away, you get Portlandian limestone, which is quite hard. Inner, it's inside the close to the town, it's a little bit softer. And so, Portlandian limestone, I think, as in Portland Bill, it, I'm pretty certain it's the same thing. Um, that's what characterizes it. I'm going to try. Mm. Oh, lovely. Oh. This is perfect. Drink it outside, particularly in the summer. Get a bottle of Petit Chablis. It's about £14. You can get it online it's from Louis Jadot. There are lots of interesting Petit Chablis out there. You'll often find producers go and make a Petit Chablis, they'll make a regular Chablis and they might have a couple of um, Premier Cru's and maybe even a Grand Cru, but we'll go through those a little bit later on. It's got citrus, bright freshness. It's a really good wine. If you are doing WSET qualifications, it's a brilliant wine to practice with because you can go all the way through. You can do it with a nice, limpid, bright, clean colour, which is straw with hints of... Uh, green little green tinges in it citrus nose it does have a kind of tang sometimes you start to get things like white pepper white flowers that come through those become a bit more 
and diverse as we go through the range. And you have a taste. Mm. Fresh tang to it. It's got a lovely sort of mouth-watering lemony acidity. That's good. But then there is this ripeness that comes through. It's extraordinary. If you go to Chablis, and I implore you when you can to go to Chablis, Go in the spring and the summer. I mean, you can just go in the summer. Um, I mean, you can go early, but go when it's a bit warmer. It's really cold in the winter, and it's famously cold in the winter. That's partly what gives the wine its charm at the start, because um, it means that the vines really sort of shut down in the, in the winter. And it's not actually that warm in wine terms in the summer. You get a beautiful ripeness, but it maintains that freshness. I seem to remember somebody saying, I think between 1950 and 1960, there were only three genuine vintages of Chablis because it was so cold they actually couldn't properly ripen the grapes. Uh, now it's much more consistent. We know how to work with vintages uh, but it is still a jolly cold wine region. I've been once twice in the winter and it's always oh, it's bitter, bitter in the cellars. Right I'm going to finish that off, I'm going to move on. Ooh. Now where we get, where is Chablis? It's in the region of Bourgogne. So it's in Bourgogne. So you've got um, Cote d'Or, which is further south, um, it's all route going towards kind of Champagne, but it's you know still much further south. But it's part of the sort of Bourgogne region. You've got the Maconnais further south and uh, Beaujolais and sort of Cote d'Or. This is distinctive in that it only makes wine from Chardonnay. It only makes one colour of wine uh, because it's white, and it makes it in different styles. Now they're quite straightforward. So we have Petit Chablis, which is a series of little areas, broadly sort of ringing the town. We're now going to go to regular Chablis. This is by a friend of mine, actually, a guy called uh, Sebastian Dant. Lovely man. Hello, Sebastian, if you're watching. Um, I first met him visiting the region, and so we were travelling around, visiting lots of different producers. He's got a beautiful house, and um, his family, like a lot of families, it's one of those regions where it's filled with people who've been there for generations, and both his parents both were themselves from great winemaking families and when they famously when they um they married they borrowed a tunnel between their two family cellars to sort of signify the union it's rather nice um let's have a go at this now he's part of a, a younger generation of wine producers who are coming through but what he's really famous for I and mean, a lot of these people are coming through is there's an ethereal elegance and sophistication about chablis it's kind of hard because i can't sit and describe it to you in fruit words you know it's not like saying well it tastes of x y and z it's kind of how you feel about it. And that's one of those things that's, I suppose, most appealing about Chablis. But it's also quite hard to get a grasp of because I'm not describing it saying it tastes like that thing, that thing, and that thing, like a fruit bowl. I'm saying it kind of tastes like that thing feels and that thing feels and the emotion you get out of such and such a thing. But that's the magic of wine. That's why we love it so much. Now, what really marks out Chablis is this thing about the soil. So it's Kimmeridgean Marl, and Marl is where you mix clay and limestone. And Kimmeridge is a town in Dorset. Um, so a lot of it's named after this sort of geological soil and periods and named after places in southern England where they were first discovered. And the soil is a similar chalk, and it's particularly made up. When you go to Chamblee, you can't get away from this, from a thing called Exogyra Virgula. You can't really see it, it's quite, they're quite small. The sort of tiny prehistoric oyster, I think it's about 150 years ago. It was Jurassic soil. Jurassic's about 150 million years ago. And these tiny little oysters, there are like trillions of them. And they're all being compacted and they're really limey. So it creates this very sort of limestone, limey, chalky soil. Um, but quite often people go and they use them as a symbol, and exogyra virgula, well, virgule is a comma, I think, in French, isn't it? It's because it's a comma shaped little fossil. You see them all over the place. You also find other bits like ammonites very often in the soil, you know, those sort of spirally things, rather beautiful. And so often people will find these fossils and get them out. Um, well, I do love, do love Chaplin. It's one of those wines that kind of got me into wine in the first place, actually. You know, I was, I was hooked on wine with Chaplin. Now, when you start to get into Chablis as opposed to British Chablis, it's a much more food friendly wine. It's a bigger and richer. There's a keener, still rather ethereal, sophisticated sort of freshness to them. There's this extraordinary tank kind of line that runs through. They are really good seafood wine. 
it's just they are amazingly good seafood ones. And I know there's that thing, you know, what grows together, you know, goes together. How this is a long way from the sea doesn't make any difference. They are really, really good seafood ones. Brilliant with shellfish, oysters, that kind of stuff. Um, it's really nice with kind of generally grilled fish. As you progress up through, you can take more robust flavours. Actually, Chablis itself, you know, and a piece of very nice, elegantly grilled fish is to die for. Keep it nice and simple. Maybe a little bit of samphire on the side. Now, I'll just tell you a little bit about this. So this is around £20. That's sort of what you pay for a good bottle of Chablis, about £20. Oh, that's really good. And um, what you'll find is that at this level, Different wines tend not to reflect, coming from different places, because they're all just from Chablis, but they'll tend to reflect slightly different ways that winemaker, winemakers work. So some winemakers might do everything in stainless steel, keep that steely freshness. Some might use barrels, and that gives them a bit of a softness. Some people will ferment for a bit longer, some people ferment a little bit warmer, some bit cooler, all of those variations. So it tends to be, you find a producer you really, really like, and kind of stick with those wines. We use ten dollars. Mm. Also, because they're tending to harvest from around the region, it irons out the subtle changes that happen in different parts of Chablis. And we've got something over here. Now, let's have a swell. So this is Chablis Premier Cru Foray by a producer called Moronode. And I knew the late Stefan Moronode. I visited in the same time I was travelling there. And it's uh, his... his uh, wife now who looks after the estate. Great winemaker. So, what are Premier Cru's? So, as we we've got this out of these bits and pieces of stuff, Petit Chablis, nice aperitif drinking, then we have Chablis itself, and then there are individual sites, usually with a sort of southern, south southwesterly sort of aspect. So, they are the slopes, and if you can imagine if there are the slopes and you've got the sort of curvature of the earth, it means that they're, they're slightly more to 90 degrees of the sun, so they capture more sunlight and have more intensity, but also they have more expression of exactly where they come from. So some of them, like Cote de Leche, these guys are in, that has a beautiful, light, fresh, I often find a sort of honeysuckle character to them, but still with a real precision. It's others which are very steely. This site, Foray, which is actually not a very common site, it's often labelled just as Montman. Some of them can get rolled into other bits. It has this extraordinary precision and intensity and a kind of slaty character. So when you start to find wines here that are bigger, um, they're not blousy. They've just got more intensity about them. And there's much more precision, and you can say where they come from. If you ever do blind tasting competitions, it's quite a lot of exams. It's extraordinary sometimes. You go, I know, wow, this is a vial. And you nail it. I remember once nailing a Cote de Leche. Even in a warm vintage, that was in 2003, and it still shone through that that was where it was from. You can still taste it. Oh, lovely. Go and get yourself a bottle. Just glorious. Hmm. Now, bear in mind, these are fine wines. This is £28. And so Premier Cru Chablis will often be around that sort of 25 30 30 something pounds. But these are fine wines from specific sites that last a long time in your palate. They are among the finest expressions of Chardonnay. Arguably, some people would say they are the finest expressions of Chardonnay in the world. And Chardonnay is this very malleable grape. You can do lots of things with it. It expresses what you want to express with it. That's one of the sort of magical things about Chardonnay. You want it to be not straightforward. You want it to be approachable, reparative drinking, it can do it. If you want it to express a site and a place, it can go and do it. If I twist round, where am I? Aha! If you want it to become one of the great wines of the world, capable of living a very long time and layers of unfolding character and interest, it can do it. This is a Grand Cru Chablis from a very particular group of sites, only very small, uh, very near the town of Chablis itself. So this is from uh, Domaine Christian Moreau. It's um, Clos des Hospices, which is within one of the areas called Les Clos. Um, 
this is one of the great wines of the world. You may be able to hear my son is having a bit of a row outside. I do apologise. I don't know if you can pick it up, but I can. He's having a right old carry on out there. Probably because he's not getting any shabbly. Because he's two. The reason I'm not opening that, this is a 2017. Grand Cru Chablis is, you need five years to let it really come good. You don't want to drink it young. At the moment, these are wines, sort of we've got 2018, 18, and I think that is also an 18. It'll say on the back, that's a 17. So 18, 18, 17. Leave this a few years. Um, I've had a very small taste off the top of it. Go back to that bit later on. It was a gift. Somebody gave me this. Very kind. Thank you very much. What we're going to go and do this week? We're actually going to try a couple of other Chablis. So we're going to be back on Wednesday and on Friday. We're going to mix up Chablis with a couple of other bits because what I want you to do is to go and buy some. But I'm giving you a couple of other recommendations from the merchants we'll talk about. So these you can find quite generally. We've got them all down on the, down there. You'll go and find where to go and buy these. But do yourself a favour. You know that thing, anything but Chardonnay, I don't drink Chardonnay. The number of people who say, I don't think drink anything, you know, drink, I don't drink Chardonnay, but I love Chablis. Well, get yourself back into Chablis because it's really remarkable. We'll come back later on in the week with the, with the two, a couple of other recommendations from different places, different styles of, of winemaking. Oh, you're enjoying this. It's a nice sort of treat. Don't do Shark Week here. If we do Chablis Week, it's a treat. Just going to sit quietly and enjoy this. See you on Wednesday. Bye-bye.